it is in everyone's interest to be concerned about everyone else. And to me, that just means love thy neighbor from a biblical standpoint. I think that whether it's domestically or internationally, that needs to be our focus writ large. And it doesn't matter if your bottom line is GDP, healthier populations create more wealth. We should all just be interested in one another. Hey, everyone. Welcome uh, to uh, Wellness at the Speed of Light podcast. We are super excited today to have Bernard Tony, a 21-year Army combat veteran who was the White House medical officer during both the Trump and Biden administrations from the period of 2018 through 2022. He trained at the Nebraska Medical Center as a physician assistant and is currently part of the Veterans Exposure Team, Health Outcomes Military Exposures. And the acronym for that is VET.VET slash HOME. He's from humble roots and joined the military at a young age and served this country with distinction, including receiving the Presidential Service Badge in 2020 and being named a Tillman Scholar after Pat Tillman in 2022. Most recently in 2023, he was inducted into the Delta Omega Honorary Society in Public Health. So excited to have him here today to cover a whole range of topics from his military career, service in the White House, his interest in overall global health and wellness, especially in the management of conditions common in the military and veterans, including exposures, concussion, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety, and the overall health strategy in this population and also in the population at large. I can't wait to dive into it with him today. So thank you so much for being here with us. So, thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure and thanks for and really thank you for, for accepting you. I mean, you've done wonderful things and, and just really want to thank you for your service, as I'm sure, you know, our listeners and, uh, and, and viewers would like to do that. Let's start like with a really broad question. What got you into military service? And then how did you end up getting into a medical career? Great question. Kind of a loaded question. But I can tell you that if I had a template to work from, it was my father. Uh, my father was uh, United States Army for a few years overseas, um, did some reserves. So I remember seeing him uh, wear the uniform even after service. I think he still wore that thing for some ungodly reason. When I was in high school, unlike many of my counterparts currently uh, that are practicing medicine, I didn't have a, a straight line trajectory to, to healthcare. I didn't have any options. I, I barely graduated high school. Um, I grew up in a very marginalized community, had a whole lot of trauma growing up, um, psychological trauma. For me, there was no other option. Like I had, it was, for me, it was, I needed a lifeline. Otherwise I was going to die in Atlanta, Georgia. And and the military was my lifeline. That's a interesting, you know, start and, you know, amazing how far you've come. And, you know, we'll talk about your time in the White House, but man, going from that story to the White House quite a journey. So anything about that story, your upbringing that, that you can remember memorably when you really felt like there was absolutely, you had, it, it was just, your, your life was over at a young age and you just were not going to succeed that eventually, you know, got you going through the military. Yeah, absolutely. So I always tell people, you know, already, you know, I had gone to war before going to war. Growing up, being around a lot of uh, crime and violence was commonplace. My earliest memories were things of uh, like my mother, you know, she would she would go out and warm up her car uh, before going to work. And I remember uh, someone jumped into the car right after she got out of it, stole the car and went and did a drive by or robbery or something of that nature, as my mom recounts it. I remember, you know, excuse me, uh, growing up and, and being um, robbed at gunpoint by the age of 12, 12, 13 years old, um, having to come home to my mother and explain to her what happened. And, you know, she tried to, you know, call the police and figure out exactly what to do. Not a whole lot you can do at that point. Um, they've taken everything you had. And if you can't ID the suspects, then you're at a lost cause. I think probably one of the most traumatic things that ever happened to me was surviving a drive-by shooting. And that occurred at the age of 17 in Atlanta, Georgia. And, you know, as I recount this story, it's sometimes a little bit jarring for people. So I just want to, for your listeners, if there's any issues, you know, I apologize in advance, but um, I was 
in a drive-by shooting. I was leaving a popular nightclub. I recently gave a, a white coat ceremony speech in, uh, in Atlanta, Georgia at Mercer College where I recounted this. And, and there were some folks in the audience that knew exactly what the name of the nightclub and where it was. But long and short, we left this nightclub. We were celebrating uh, graduating high school, our upcoming graduation, which was very, you know, it was, for us, it was a big, you know, big milestone. I think for a lot of people, that's kind of just like one of the waypoints on the way to whatever their career is going to be for, for us, it was much more grand for, you know, for my cohort of people. Um, only about 75% of people that go to the schools that I went to graduate from high school. For me, many of that 75% barely make it through high school. And so for us to be graduating, that was significant. As we were graduating, we decided to go to this popular nightclub. I was graduating from an alternative school, which um, that meant that I was not in my traditional school setting. I was going to be graduating in March. And my friend was graduating from a traditional school. And we were so excited that he was making the grace to do that. Left a club and we go to a gas station and shots ring out. Bullets start to hit my car. I could see the lights coming on, to, you know, my, my dashboard, the radio leaking fluid, the door is shot. And unfortunately, my best friend, Ivan Gray, was shot. He gets into the vehicle. I'm driving off and trying to get out of the kill zone. Shots continue to ring out as I'm trying to get out of there. And I drive about a mile down the street or so. And as I'm getting out of that area, um, he leans over onto my hand after convulsing for quite a bit and blood starts pulling all over my hand. So I immediately knew something was significantly wrong. I pull over another vehicle with a friends behind me, pull over as well. And we, we pull them out of the car. And I, I still remember everyone saying, don't let them go to sleep. Don't let, don't let them go to sleep. And so I'm sitting there trying to keep them alive while calling 911. And there was nothing that I can do. I remember the dispatcher asked me, where is he shot? You know, it's, it's late at night, maybe one in the morning. I have no idea where he shot. He's wearing an all black shirt, black uh, leather jacket. And I just know that, you know, he's not doing okay. And so that was probably the most helpless that I've ever felt in my entire life. Nonetheless, he died. And so um, that was the moment where I felt the most helpless. That was the moment where I felt the most vulnerable. Um, and I think that was also the moment where I wanted to be in a position to help people in their darkest moments. And fast forward about 20 years or so, I was put in a position to save the president if he were in the same situation. Thank you for sharing that story. Truly, you know, amazing. I can see the emotion, you know, all over your face, hear it in your voice and, you know, hard to recount that. I know you've recounted that. And I, you know, I've seen that story that, you know, when you posted it on, uh, on LinkedIn, one beautiful post, I was quite moved, but not as moved as I, I am, you know, hearing it from you directly. And I think our listeners really need to just really hear that because there are so many people out there that have similar experiences, you know, than you that don't get the chance to be in a position where you're, you, you know, you eventually ended up and, you know, the work that you've done and what you're doing is, is really helping a, a lot of people. And I know you have big, big goals and big dreams, you know, ahead of you in your career. You know, on that note, is there somebody that I know it's, it's sometimes it's hard. It's a difficult question sometimes for, for people to answer because there's a lot of people along the way, like, for example, yeah. that helped me. So it's tough for me to answer some of these questions sometimes. But can you tell us about one of your mentors and potentially, you know, how they helped you to get from point A to, to point B along your journey? Just to your point, there's way too many people to, to mention. But, I, you know, I can tell you that <clears throat> I always felt like God put someone in my path at a critical point. And, you know, if I were to go back to the earliest moments of when this succession of men, largely um, African-American men were, that were put in my life strategically placed um, to be able to help guide me and direct me and keep me on a good azimuth, there's a guy named um, Gary Berkeley. You know, he's on my LinkedIn. He's, he's a good friend. And he was a, a drill instructor, a drill sergeant. When I came into the military, I was escaping or running away from my tragedies and the way I grew up and things like that. But I was also running towards something. I just didn't know what the something was. And when I got into the military, it wasn't, it wasn't easy for me. I didn't look like most people. I jokingly say that I look like a, a you know, I'm short and five, three. So I look like a blend of Kevin Hart and Lil Wayne I had, uh, I had a 12 gold teeth and <laughs> that's, that's great. I had 12 gold teeth and 
and I had tattoos and you know, all this stuff uh, that, that made me not look like the typical soldier. You know, all that was kind of became a part of my, you know, my aura at the age of 15. And so I joined the military and, and you know, I'm in a largely Caucasian environment because I, I joined the military in military intelligence. And so I joined as a as a as a Russian linguist. And so there wasn't many African Americans or anyone of color in that space. And I remember looking so different and it was so jarring for a lot of people. Um, and I just re recount that people were like, you know, what kind of accident did you get into? You know, were you, uh, I remember learning about 007 and people thought I was Jaws. I had never watched 007, but I just remember all of these different analogies for why it is that I look the way that I look. Um, it wasn't lost on some of the other drill instructors though. They, they would ask me like, what gang are you from? you shouldn't be in the military. There were some points where there were racial slurs, you know, thrown my way. And there was this one Gary Berkeley who would do things like he would walk up to me and pretend to yell at me, you know, get down, start doing push-ups and things like that. And, and so as I'm doing push-ups, he would kneel next to me and say, don't let them take this away from you. I know where you came from, you know? And so he would say, if you, if you give into them, if you let loose, if you give up, uh, you're going to be back in Atlanta, Georgia. And so um, that gentleman early on in my life gave me the will to continue going because I did want to quit. It was hard to be seen as an animal or as a monster in a space where no one else really understands why you look the way you look, why you talk the way you talk, where you come from. They just know you're so different. Um, and so in that way, I was really incompatible with the military to the point that there was leadership that tried to put me out of the military because they just said, you can, you know, you, this isn't, this isn't okay. We can't have a soldier look this way. But Gary Berkeley, while we just had just a short period of time together, he was always um, between me and, and the propensity for me to lash out, for me to be self-destructive um, and for me to ultimately ruin my life. That is what I needed early on. And, and so I think that that was, that started a succession of people, a domino of, of leaders that poured into me and saw something in me that I couldn't see in myself. So if I can say anyone that had the earliest impact, it would be uh, Gary Berkeley. I, I mean, thanks for sure. That's a, I mean, that's a great story. You know, one of my favorite sayings that, you know, I've heard before in, in a, in a church setting is sort of, you know, God doesn't give us what we want. He gives us what we need. And mm -hmm. so I think that certainly you had the people that you needed, you know, put in front of you, as did I, to be able to, you know, to get through like really difficult circumstances and get to, you know, get to where you are now. So thank you for sharing that. So how did you end up in the White House? Yeah. <laughs> Great question. <laughs> So there's the fundamentals that you have to have. You have to have had a, a distinguished career. You have to have had a certain degree. We have a, different medical professionals in the White House medical unit. You had to have had a top secret security clearance with some additional layers of clearance that say that you are trustworthy enough to be within arm's reach of the president. And you had to have gone through a very rigorous interview process to make sure that while, yes, you may be smart, you may also have the skills that we're looking for, but are you compatible with, with the environment of working within a White House? I think there's a certain personality of people that do well, and there's other people who don't do very well. There's folks that spend a lot of time in special operations, and they can probably save just about anyone at any time in any condition, but maybe they're too gruff. Maybe they just don't. They don't gel well in that environment. So I think I I had I checked all the boxes. I had a lot of combat experience. I was battlefield tested. I had the requisite courses that we generally look for. I had gone to was called flight surgeon school. So I understood how to perform critical care and route. I knew the the differences that occur physiologically at altitude. I had a lot of the shooting schools and everything else that people will say, are you able to, to be in a very contested environment, a difficult environment, but still do your job. 
And so I flew out to Washington, D.C. I interviewed for several days with soon to be peers. And they take you through a battery of different tests and scenarios and things like that to see if you're consistent with what they look for. And I was ultimately successful in that endeavor. And I was recruited over in 2018 and stayed for four years, almost four years. Thanks for your service. That must have been a, just an amazing period in your life. So I need to ask, I know that there's, you have to be anonymous and obviously there's HIPAA and there's all these other things. Is there any, anything that happened over those four years that you can share like a memorable patient story with and being completely anonymous about it, something that happened, an emergency that you took care of, a life-saving event, or just something you witnessed at your time there? Yeah, I would say that I had probably, not just I, but the, the other team members that we had at the time, we were in the White House at a very critical time point in history. We were at the White House, if you can imagine, during the social unrest, being exposed to riots, just about all over the country, everywhere we went, COVID-19 became a major issue while we were at the White House Medical Unit during that time. I can say that broadly, it was tumultuous for all of those reasons. And without going into any granular details, it, it took a whole of a whole of government, whole of society approach for us to be able to do our work. I think the COVID-19 pandemic was one of the things that that I can think of most readily that that shook the core of everyone in the way we had to bring in the uh, CDC epidemiologists to be able to help us out and, and provide that epidemiological work while we continue to do our job of taking care of the president, vice president, first lady. And just to be clear, my role was largely to do the medical planning and then collapse onto the president with a part of a larger team in a larger infrastructure, but oftentimes I was the primary provider and sole provider for the vice president and the first lady. And so it was just a, it was just an interesting time that, that we served because there were so many compounding urgencies and emergencies in addition to just the normal stressors of, of daily life at the White House. Well, that sounds like it was four years of just a lot going on. I'm sure long hours and yeah, there was so much going on. I mean, once the pandemic hit, I mean, I just, that, that felt like a 10 year period for me being in, in healthcare. I mean, it completely changed the way we did everything. We were put on hold. Our patients were just put in these big, long waiting lists and they were right. miserable. We had call after call, people just crying in pain, their surgeries delayed. They didn't know what to do, not to mention- mm -hmm how many people got really sick and right. succumbed to COVID-19. And there was just so much uncertainty. And there was a period of time, right, where everybody felt, I can't even imagine what it was like in the White House. Everybody felt like the world was ending. Like the, it, we were never going to get back to any kind of normalcy. And right. it was just nothing but chaos for a while. And, I mean, I know we. it was a very difficult time. So between that and you guys being involved actually in government at the same time that this is all going on. Yeah. Many people were able to your point, many people were able to take a pause. I, I know a lot of the healthcare sector were we were stretched beyond belief. I think that was the great the greatest cause of, of this large exodus of like nurses and other healthcare professionals yes. from the from healthcare. It was tremendous. But for us, we didn't have a lot of patients. I mean, certainly we did care by proxy, which meant that we take care of those that take care of the boss. We took care of Secret Service. We took care of cabinet members. We took care of White House staff, et cetera. But our primary focus was largely continuity of government. So that meant that on any given day, on any given mission, the only person that, you know, that really mattered was the person that we were covering. And so if that was the president, the vice president, or the first lady, that's our single patient. And largely overarching was continuity of government. So the fear of being the one person that exposes your principal to COVID-19 was not lost on any of us. And so it was, we had to live a different life. It wasn't just about, not to say that any one person and that anyone who knows me knows that I don't think that any one human is more important than another, but when you're taking care of the leader of the free world, is a different level of concern that you have 
to be able to make sure that person isn't exposed to an infectious disease, whatever it may be. And so we carried that around quite a bit. And that was largely our focus was making sure that we had an existing government. And that meant that we had to keep our principles uh, safe and healthy. Just in incredible. And I'm sure there was a lot of fear in the time of uh, COVID-19 about the potential for somebody to succumb on the White House. And again, we know some of the stories. We, you know, we mm -hmm. all have news and we're able to watch that stuff. But man, on a global basis, it was just an incredible time. And were you involved at all in kind of in the Operation Warp Speed at the time? No. So that was external to the White House. And just as I didn't mention earlier, just a disclaimer, I don't speak for anyone in the White House Medical Unit. This is Bernard Tony's perspective. But, but no, we were not directly involved in Operation Warp Speed, which in my opinion, it was probably one of the most phenomenal things that we could have done from a whole society approach. Our only mission and focus, primary focus was the principles that we covered. So there were a lot of externalities that were going on. There was a lot of epidemiologic investigation. There was all these other different things, Operation Warp Speed to your point. But our major focus was how do we keep, keep our principles safe? And so everything else was really just on the periphery. That's, I, again, a, just a, a, an absolutely a, amazing time. I feel like we've finally gotten somewhat away from that critical period. And mm -hmm. it seems like things are a lot more normal with the way the world is going, but certainly pandemic preparedness, which is something I know you're, it's near and dear to your heart, is something that I think really put it, that whole episode, put it on the map. And I think it's much more a part of kind of the governmental outlook at this time, preparing for the next pandemic. And let's mm -hmm. pray that that mm -hmm. is not something that we need to deal with for the next 50 or 100 years, as Absolutely. they tend to as they tend to come in those kind of time frames. So I think we're going to ask you some another question that I think you, you can answer without disclosing anything. Is there anything different? It's just a curiosity question. Is there anything different about the way some of these very important people to our country are treated from a preventative medicine standpoint or a workup in a case of if they're not feeling well or something like that, where it's different than what you might find in the general population for Joe the painter or something like that? Right. Great question. And again, without going into any granular details, no, everyone's treated with the same standard of care, if you will. Great. For us, again, without going into any granular details, it's just that there isn't probably a person on a planet that has the same comprehensive care available at all times. And so I don't mean just access to care. I just literally mean at all times. There isn't any, at any moment of any hour of any day in which, in which the full scope of medical care and assets are not made available. And so that speaks to, to our, our principles. For other members, cabinet members and things like that, certainly we offer a comprehensive care, executive medicine, that kind of thing. But it's very specific to a president or vice president, that level of comprehensive care that's available at all time, anywhere, anytime, at any point around the world is always there and available. We just can't really speak any more to that. No, absolutely. That's, I mean, that's a great answer. I just didn't know if basically every genetic test and every single lab, like, you know, you go down the list of labs. If you go down a lab sheet, like for example, LabCorp, that's a big one here in our town. You mm -hmm. could order hundreds and hundreds of labs. I didn't know if every single cabinet member and the president and first, everybody got like everything every six weeks to just make sure everything's perfect. And they're a perfectly oiled machine right. so that they can continue <laughs> to run the government. I just don't know. I mean, clearly you're an insider and you tell me what you can tell me, obviously. So yeah. we very much appreciate that. We're, I'm going to start changing the trajectory a little bit to get more mm -hmm. into kind of what the spirit of the show is. So when I made the decision to bring this show out, I really wanted to bring in experts from all walks of life, both in kind of Western trained, sort of like yourself, 
but then Eastern trained people on alternative medicine and things like that. And this is a, a tremendously unique perspective. And I think that the audience is really going to enjoy that first little bit there and getting to know you a little bit and understanding what you've gone through to get to this mm -hmm. point and a little bit about your time in the White House. But now I want to just kind of shift gears mm -hmm. into sort of what we're doing on the show, which is trying to really figure out how to make people more well and improve their health over the next, let's say, year or decade and on from there, because I am become like rabidly passionate mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. what's going on in the health crisis. And I really want to pick your brain on, on just a bunch of different topics and then get okay. into kind of the veterans issues and, and the military issues, which is really interesting and something that, that I wasn't as familiar with. But in doing the mm -hmm. research, it's just like, it's really fascinating stuff. So one right. of the questions that I put, I'm going to put every, everyone that comes on the show is going to know that I'm going to ask them this question. One of the things that I have seen mm -hmm. is, in, in my own opinion, is overuse of the Western medical system. And that includes overuse of medications overuse of procedures, overuse of, it's just more, I would even, not even using overuse, but just so much of this huge emphasis mm -hmm. on interventions. Mm -hmm. And my frustration has been, why are we not focusing on diet, exercise, holistic, alternative treatments? And as we spoke about before, on our couple minutes before we started this, a lot of these alternative treatments that are out there, these are new to me as well. As a Western trained mm -hmm. physician, I just wasn't trained on a lot of these things. And, mm -hmm. and now I've just made a massive commitment in the remainder of my career to, to focus on these things because I think we can really help people. What's mm -hmm. your level mm -hmm. of frustration been having been an insider and also being involved in global health and how we're approaching our crisis? My major frustration, and I think that this is what most people can identify with they're just feeling like we're spinning our wheels how many antihypertensives can we prescribe before we feel like we're not making an impact how many prescriptions of metformin on and on if you're talking about joint health we know the that obesity impacts joint health but we know that we have one of the highest rates of obesity around the world that's increasing precipitously i think that i'm frustrated just like many people is that we're putting band-aids on a traumatic bleed. And so we're not really helping people in a comprehensive way. You speak about global health. I cut my teeth in medicine and family medicine over in South Korea. And I worked there for about a year. And I and one of the stark differences that I noticed is that people were largely healthier when it came to their metabolic profile. And that was largely from diet. People ate more fish. Their lipid panels looked dramatically different from what I saw in the United States. People moved more, they walked more, obesity rates were much lower. And to your point, there was a combination of Eastern and Western medicine in places like South Korea. And I think that was interesting to see that, but it was also, it was also a revelation, if you will, that is more than what I think we can provide in, a, in an exam room or in an interdisciplinary setting. I think that there's larger upstream issues that we have to address that inform people's overall health. And I think that's what we're largely missing in marginalized populations around the world, specifically in the United States. And I can point to Washington, D.C. as a very good use case with respect to how people are healthy on one side of Washington, D.C. and have a difference of life expectancy of about 10 years than just the other side of Washington, right. D.C. if you just cross the Anacostia River. So again, I think that what we need to focus on is yes, interdisciplinary approaches that are beyond pharmacologic and interventions that we can perform, but largely upstream issues that are more policy driven. So we can certainly delve into that in my perspective as well. Wonderful. So I think that you said a couple of things. I love the way you said it, putting a, a bandaid on a traumatic bleed. And I mm -hmm. think just the word, I mean, that's a, gr a great analogy. And I really think it is a traumatic bleed. I think this is a this is a knife wound to the carotid. I mean, this mm -hmm. is like, 
we are our health system is so overwhelmed right now by by this health crisis the other thing that's real interesting about what you brought up is how much healthier some populations are than others within even the same geographic area. But what's even more interesting is some of what we believe, even me as a physician, before I really dove into it, what we believe to be sometimes healthy. I mean, I know the population you're talking mm -hmm. about, a sick population. Mm -hmm. That we used to do, we used to mm -hmm. do rounds at Harlem Hospital when I was at Columbia mm -hmm. University. We would just mm -hmm. find people were just dead, right? We mm -hmm. round mm -hmm. on them and they were like dead. So mm -hmm. I understand what happens in certain populations. However, I think the population at large, where what I felt, even patients that I would see that I felt them to be quote unquote healthy, mm -hmm. if you look at them metabolically, they may not be healthy at all. And one of the studies that is very interesting, there's a lot of stuff out there, but Tufts looked at mm -hmm. a large cross-sectional group of the population, 55,000, pretty much representative, all comers, mm -hmm. all walks of life. And they looked at different markers like blood pressure, blood glucose, cardiovascular mm -hmm. uh, disease, their lipid profile, like you talked about before. And then obviously obesity and their waist measurements and things like that. Interestingly, seven, seven percent of the population was found to be healthy in that respect. In metabolic, that's one out of 15 people are found to have some to say you are metabolically healthy. So I think the problem is a lot worse than we think. And I mm -hmm. think that through education, we can start getting the word out that we're a lot sicker than we think we are. And right. one of the things they commented, if you read that tough study, which I'm happy to send you, it's interesting because those people that are moderate, they talk about how they're, man, they're just on that precipice. Right. I mean, and if we can arrest that through preventative measures, diet, nutrition, some of the alternative modalities that I'm really become passionate about, man, I, the difference that we can make is so dramatic and it just is going to take a lot of us. We have to, I always talk about like, even on, I've been posting a lot more on LinkedIn lately talking about this stuff, but I just mm -hmm. think it's going to just take an army of medical providers that just stand up and just say, you know what, we're, it, things are not going well. Right. And we got to get right. down to the bottom of this. So my question to you, my very long-winded question to you, by the way, is how can we make policy changes that perhaps bring some of these things more to light and how badly we're misstepping right now? Yeah, thank you for that. I, so my philosophy is that the, the zip code determines health outcomes more than a genetic code. That's not the way that I was taught in school. I was always taught that African-Americans are more susceptible to hypertension, diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. I think that when we start looking at policy, it has to be cross-sectoral. It can't just be the healthcare sector that is trying to address many of these challenges. I use infectious disease as a good example. Many of the hospital systems were trying to figure out why they couldn't get their patients in to be tested for COVID or, or the administration of a vaccine they realize that, wait a minute, a lot of our population are heavily reliant on public transportation and that public transportation doesn't run near our hospital. And so we have to get more proximate to those vulnerable populations to be able to address that. If I were to take Washington, D.C. as an example, again, I know we want to look at the larger population, but just look at Washington, D.C. If you look at this broken up into eight wards, wards one through six are, we'll call it, moderate to high income settings and ward seven and eight is largely socioeconomic deprived. Well, those wards, if we're talking about, Hey, we need you to eat healthier. These are, this is my prescription for you to eat healthier. These are the things that I want you to eat. Look at how many grocery stores are in that area. Yes. Right. And so we need to say, okay, is that even possible? If we say it with our white coats on and from our exam mm -hmm. rooms, is it even possible? because maybe they live in a sw food swamp or a food desert. I've heard food apartheid thrown around. But if we say you need more exercise, we don't really take the time. And I'm putting the onus on healthcare professionals to know what that setting looks like. Do you have sidewalks? Do you have green space? 
is it even safe for you to run outside? I remember growing up in some places in Atlanta, Georgia, and the answer to all three of those questions were no. So I think if we're looking at health outcomes, we need to look cross-sectorally to say, what is the education sector doing to teach children as early as possible about healthy eating, not after they've become obese and now that they've come to our clinics, but what are we doing early on from a preventative standpoint to make sure they know what healthy eating looks like? What are we doing from the housing sector and from other elements of society to say, are we putting people in healthy spaces? Do we have green spaces? Are we ensuring that from a policy perspective that local politicians and constituents are advocating for grocery stores that offer healthy food options. I think that we can be doing a whole lot more with respect to the care that's delivered to people, because as we're talking about interdisciplinary care, there's large gaps of our population that are either uninsured or underinsured. So this information that we have, they don't even receive it. So what are we doing to address healthcare coverage? People may say that universal health is more of a socialistic perspective, but we have too many different health systems in the United States of America. We have people like me who have veteran care, who served in the military. You have people who get their insurance from employer-based systems. We have folks that are poor or socioeconomically disadvantaged, so they get Medicaid. And then you have older people who get Medicare. But then you have all these gaps in between all of these different systems. And so we haven't found a way to comprehensively cover from a healthcare perspective, all of our population. And so that is criminal, in my opinion. I think we have to do much more to make sure that people are able to get the basic fundamental preventative measures that should be afforded to every American, irrespective of where they live. So I think to answer your question, it's not just a healthcare solution. It's a cross-sectoral solution that we'll have to derive from the policy perspective. And that has to be monitored and ex executed all the way down to the lowest common denominator. I think that's, that's a great answer. And there's certainly a lot to unpack there. And what you said, I would say the first thing is, as a physician, it's crystal clear that somebody's socioeconomic background makes a huge difference into how much education they have on a lot of these preventative measures, irrespective of whether or not they have a primary care doctor or, or not. It just makes a big difference because in many ways, those they just have different access and different things. Number two, well, well said, when you talk about sort of kind of food apartheid and those kinds of things, it's interesting because there was a time in my career before I got into like really hardcore the, the wellness measures where mm -hmm. my primary thing I would do with patients is talk to them about diets. And one of my favorite diet is something called the paleo diet, which is sort of like Atkins, a, a little bit different. I mean, we could go on and on for forever. But one of the problems with the paleo diet is patients have to be on a lot of meats Mm -hmm. and expensive food. So that's a twofold thing. Number one, sometimes people don't even have access to the ability to find the stores in their neighborhood where they could even get high quality meats and those foods, mm -hmm. fish, things like that, that you mentioned before. It, it, the second thing is that kind of from an educational, they are in toxic food environments as mm -hmm. well. And so if you look at the food environments in schools, other than the, the top schools on the country, that's mm -hmm. a big problem across schools. And I've talked about that before. That's a great point. The other thing I'll say, so that's one fold. There's no question that, you're so, that we have to try to level the playing field as mm -hmm. far as what people are able to have access to. Mm -hmm. The other mm -hmm. point, which I'm really trying to make a, a point of is, even people that do have access to Western primary care services. Mm -hmm. And again, mm -hmm. we have the best health system in the world. When you're really sick, I'd like to be here. Okay. There's a lot of other good health systems, but if you're really sick, I would right. prefer to be here. There's other good health systems. I don't want to take that away. There's plenty of other countries where you'll be fine as well. Mm -hmm. However, 
our mindset, our Western mindset, even in preventative medicine, I don't mm -hmm. think goes anywhere near far enough to address the root causes of illness. And I don't right. think that we are able to really bring the message of how much harm we're doing to ourselves with these, what, what I would consider mad made diseases, obesity, right. type right. two diabetes, right. early onset Alzheimer's disease. And right. on. They're not all man made. I don't want people to get upset about that, but a vast majority of our chronic health conditions are man made. Because if you look before 1970, a right. lot of these things didn't exist. And if you look at the trajectory, for example, of obesity in this country, it's a one way street and it's straight up, right? right? right. It's really disturbing. So on that note, I think that like for those, you're just getting the double whammy if you're mm -hmm. in a poor socioeconomic situation, mm -hmm. because not only mm -hmm. do you not have access to the stuff that you need, but on the other hand, even if you have a little bit of access that what you're getting access to is more traditional Western medicine. Right. And again, as a Western trained physician, we are not particularly great at patients coming in saying, Hey, doc, I just don't feel good. Right. Mm -hmm. And most of their labs, like standard labs are mm -hmm. reasonable, but they don't mm -hmm. feel well, then what do you mm -hmm. do with those patients? They may, or are we really looking at where they are metabolically and trying to help them? And I, and that's why I really try right. to bring on as many people yeah. as I can to think about these ideas and just keep, yeah. keep talking, keep the dialogue right. going. And eventually right. I I think we can make a, a just a huge impact. It's Go interesting ahead. that you mentioned these other health systems. I don't know how familiar you are with the Commonwealth Fund, but they did a report back in, I think, 2017 that compared the United States against other high-income countries, Germany, Switzerland, places like that. Don't quote me on the countries there. But there were other high-income countries, and, uh, and we had the worst health outcomes. Uh, and it was very interesting to see the data that poured out, and it wasn't just the worst health outcomes. Certainly they looked at maternal mortality and infant mortality and things like that, but they also looked at chronic disease. And one of the measures that they looked at was essentially how many of the American population had two or more chronic diseases. And the United States ranked last on that metric. So health outcomes, not just health equity, but health outcomes writ large Absolutely. across all demographics were, uh, we ranked last out of, I believe it was 11 countries that were measured. I, I encourage you to look at that because it was a very interesting comprehensive report. And it's one of those things that's pointed to commonly in the public health space to say, if we are spending 16, 17% of our GDP on healthcare, why do we have the worst health outcomes compared to other high income countries? That wasn't exclusive to, uh, to poor, or, socioeconomically disadvantaged populations. It was the United States were large. And, and yeah, absolutely. And, and it goes along. And that, again, when I say, if you have a serious health problem, mm -hmm. you want to be in the United States. What I'm really talking about is yeah. our ability to take care. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, our group, our spine, our spine and neurosurgical mm -hmm. group, we take care of a level one trauma center. Okay. Got it. Okay. So we manage all these traumas. If you are extricated, right? Jaws of life. Mm -hmm. You are extricated from a vehicle, right? United States of America, our trauma, our ability to take care of trauma and fix fractures and hemodynamically unstable people Absolutely. is at that it, you, we're going to find that at the time, I'm not, I can't point to, point to a specific study, but it's a well-known right. thing. I mean, we can really right. save lives or if you have some crazy brain tumor or <laughs> some <laughs> kidney thing that's never been seen before. We've right. got these world-class institutions where people fly right. in from all over the country. However, right. on the chronic disease, which you nailed it, we are- The most significant burden of disease huge, in the United States. Absolutely yes. outstripping everything. If we look at those metrics, we are absolutely awful. And I see that. I have mm -hmm. patients come in as one of my pet peeves. All these people- 35, 40, 45 mm -hmm. years old, medication list, two pages long. And I'm mm -hmm. just thinking, to, how did we get here? How did this yeah. human being in front of me get here? And as a medical system, could we have done more along the way to try to prevent them from ever even getting to the point where they needed to have 
all this par- you know, polypharmaceutical mm-hmm, treatment mm-hmm. and all this invasive stuff, which is, it's so expensive to the system. Mm-hmm. I mean, the burden mm-hmm. of care, and you know when it really came out, and you know this best, COVID absolutely mm-hmm. exposed absolutely. how sick mm-hmm. our population is, right? The absolutely. metabolically worse you were, the mm-hmm. worse you did, period. I mean, yep. we just, we, that, we just know that. And so I think that put a lot of these things more on the radar and people started talking about, not that they weren't talking, but more, talking more about metabolic mm-hmm. dysfunction, mitochondrial mm-hmm. dysfunction, like how mm-hmm. that all ties together. Because mm-hmm. if we had another pandemic, we know who's most exposed, people that are not right. metabolically well. And talking about what I said before, if only 7% of our population is quote unquote, metabolically fit, we're not mm-hmm. exactly prepared for the next disaster coming down the road. And, and to your and, point, if, we're, if we continue on the same trajectory, then that 7% is not likely 7%. That is know, correct. To, um, yeah. And so, yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I th- I, again, I think from a policy perspective, this has to be a comprehensive approach. And we just, at least from a legislative standpoint, we just haven't figured out a way to uh, to be able to provide that level of coverage. I mean, that coverage extends all the way down to the preventative care so that we're not in this scenario. But again, I, I think there's a, an intimate song and dance with the other sectors, transportation sector, education sector. And if we have more physicians like yourself that, have, that are deep in the bona fides of medicine that understand that we have to have more of these cross-sectoral solutions, I think then we have a, a shared understanding of what actually needs to happen. Because I'm with you. I understand this wholeheartedly, and I see this. I think any person who looks on a map of just obesity over the last 20, 30, 40 years, it almost looks like the weather changing from temperature from full 70s to 80s to 90s. It's just more overweight and obesity that's impacting the United States of America, and that means that we have more chronic disease. But I think the drivers of that is very comprehensive across across sectors. That's a great answer. A couple more things before we move into kind of, we'll call it military medicine, which is, mm-hmm. again, really mm-hmm. fascinating. One of the kind of my gripes with legislation and what's being done, and again, mm-hmm. I am not just kind of personally, I don't want, I think we can't legislate everything, right? We have right. to, we just have to, as a society, what are our values? What are our goals? And how are we going to kind of change the mentality? But one of the interesting questions I have for you is there are somewhere in the neighborhood of pushing 3,000 additives that we put Mm -hmm. into foods. And there is a clear known connection between so many of these things. And I know some of them are clearly, there, there are things that are on the ban list, but there are so many additives that are contributing to the public health crisis. And I know that, for example, like the Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act kind of covers some of these additives. And then there's this like California Food Safety Act that's coming down the road in 2027. I don't know why it's 2027. Why? Like, (laughs) where do you come up with like, why not 2057? Why don't we wait until everybody has a chronic disease, right? And so, again, not to try to force things, but we have some of the loosest kind of guardrails against food additives, right? When Mm -hmm. compared to other Western countries, which may be part of why we're seeing chronic, there's a lot to unpack, but one is additives. Where do you think legislation should go on looking at these additives and maybe banning them? Because there are so many foods, you look at those labels, there are things on some of these foods, I mean, without question, and I have all these amazing guests that are going to come on that are just going to pound the table on some of this stuff. I mean, I have some amazing guests who have already agreed to be on the show. I'm excited to have them on and that's their area of expertise. So we'll leave it to them. Like, yeah, but just generally having been somebody who's so deep into policy, do you Mm -hmm. think there's a role for for people to really stand up and say, we can't do this anymore? Even before we sat down today, I had a conversation with one of my colleagues over at the FDA um, who works in the pharmaceutical industry. We t- we talked that nauseam about this and her thoughts were essentially just the rigor to be able to study these additives in a clinical way 
are is very difficult. It's very difficult. It's, it almost falls in line into the same bucket of herbal supplements and things that have not been evaluated by the FDA, but that's sort of the carte blanche pass to be able to say, well, we haven't evaluated this. We can't really report on the efficacy or safety of it. And so that badge of uh, not being clear by the FDA is one way that people are able to get around this. And I think it's a way to circumvent things. Just the sheer number of additives, the sheer number of things that are not medicinal, pharmaceutical in nature is very difficult to legislate against unless there's very rigorous studies to show the safety of them. And I think that's always going to be the challenge with a lot of these things because there may be correlation, but the question is, where's the causation? And so there has to be funding for that and who's going to fund that and how is it going to be done in a non-biased way? I think that, that is ultimately the challenge. I think that to your point, you can't le legislate everything, but I'm not confident that society writ large understands those risks. And I'll be honest with you, I don't think that a lot of clinicians do either. And until we can get that information that's distilled in a way that the clinicians can understand what this, what the risks are, and not everyone has access to a dietitian or a nutritionist, how do we get this into the hands of the general pop, general population, meaning pro at the primary care level and at the public health level in a way that we can create guidelines for them? In the absence of that, I think that a lot of these companies that add these uh, additives to, to their products and ingredients really have carte blanche to be able to continue to do so because there isn't anything that says that it's unsafe until we can figure that part out. I think we're going to be in status quo of being able to say this has not been evaluated by the FDA. We've done our own rigorous testing to make sure that things are safe. And ultimately, the population writ large just has to trust that. I don't think that we currently have a good solution for it. I mean, I think that's a great answer. And it's true. There's so many different chemicals. How do you study them independently? You don't know what's right. interacting with what. I mean, there are some that that are known as not the greatest. Right. And so those are the ones more you know, I'm talking about. But I think that, and again, we're going to have guests specifically that this is mm -hmm. kind of their life's work, mm -hmm. thinking about some of these things. So I'm hoping to tease this out for our audience. But I think that generally focusing on whole foods, things mm -hmm. that don't have labels, being in those aisles of the grocery store that are on the sides oh, and not is, being yes. in the center, Right. So generally, there's a reason that things don't have a label because it's a quick, their label is food, right? right. If you eat right. a banana, it's food, right? Right. If you eat an apple, it's food. Right. And so looking, I mean, it's clear in the literature that whole food mm -hmm. diets do better than other things, right? If you have a piece of meat, it's, well, not all meat. I should say, if you have a piece of steak, <laughs> it's food. <laughs> There right. are other right. heavily processed meats with all kinds of things in them. And again, we'll right. I'll get through all that. The same thing goes with sugar content. Mm -hmm. And so there's a doctor mm -hmm. out there who's very well known. I, I encourage you to follow him on LinkedIn. There's a couple guys out there, but there's one yeah. guy, his name is Robert Lustig. Okay. okay. There's another doc, Robert Lufkin. They're both, they talk ad nauseum about this stuff, but specifically Dr. Lustig talks about, and, and he's pretty adamant about it, regulating this stuff like we regulate alcohol and tobacco. I think that what public health is able to do is able to look at the disease burden of any one thing and say, this is a significant risk and we have to figure out a way from a policy perspective to mitigate it. We've seen this with seatbelts. We looked at the number of fatalities on the highways. There's a lot of opposition. Automobile manufacturers. I say we, we can't afford to to be able to put these restraints into everyone's cars. There's people who might even say that was a breach of their own freedom to say, no, I don't want to do this. And we have to figure out a way to do that. We did that same thing with, uh, with cigarettes and advertisements for cigarettes because we recognize the correlation with malignancy. I think we absolutely have to be able to do that when it comes to foods and drinks that are high in sugar content. There's been a lot of efforts to be able to do that in a public health space. A lot of those efforts were met with extreme opposition, and many of those efforts were oftentimes unsuccessful. Because again, 
when you're fighting against industry that's largely profitable on these types of products is very difficult, even with all the data, even with all the statistics, even with the incidence and the prevalence of, let's say, diabetes, it is difficult to have a unilateral approach from the health sector to say that we need to be able to make these these changes. We Again, this has to be a cross-sectoral whole of society push to be able to make those types of changes. Yeah, I think, great answer. I think that we, as healthcare providers though, I think that one of the things that we really can do to help people is to absolutely pound the table and be anti-sugar. And I've become more and more anti-sugar because the the amount of of of, of cellular just 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 total body metabolic damage that it creates, right. it's clear, it's crystal clear. There's nothing about it. This is not like it's not a gray area, as right. some of the industry forces might want you to right. believe. It's crystal clear, and it's actually so interesting. There's this Dr. Lufkin, and mm-hmm. he always posts things about like kind of sugar content, and I. Mm-hmm. I would encourage our listeners to follow him on LinkedIn. I'll definitely do that. And so he will like show basically one time he showed, and again, without naming the coffee company, he showed mm-hmm. the, all of their brands, like all their frappuccinos and this and that. If mm-hmm. he, and then he stacks the sugar cubes in front of each of the mm-hmm. particular drinks. And I can tell you, those sugar cubes stack really high. And just one of those drinks may be already way outside of what the sugar intake should be for people on an entire day basis. They get that in their six o'clock coffee before right. they start their day. And that's not to mention all the sugary cereals and donuts and this right. goes on and on. I think though, one of the challenges that we have is that I've seen, we've all seen that. We've all seen when someone lays out what a, a pound of fat looks like. I think The challenge is being able to make that connection with the general population to say, well, what does that mean? Even if you give me a bunch of sugar cubes and stuff, I still have no idea what that means for me now, for me in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. I don't know if I'm going to have significant morbidity and mortality associated with that. I don't know if I'm shortening my life. So I think the challenge is the communication of what does this mean at the ninth grade education level so that it is diffusely understood across the general population. Because I don't think that the tactic thus far of saying this is going to give you diabetes. Well, I know many people who are all like, they'll just take their sugar pill. They're, they're okay with, I have to take my sugar pill. I have to take my water pill. Like th- that's the way that they sort of approach life. There's a medication if I ended up with this disease that you're speaking of. So I think that the challenge, the real crux of the matter is is giving this meaning to people, everyday people, so they know what the health impacts are. They know that they're not going to be able to be alive to see their grandbabies. You know, what does this mean to people, really? You can tell them all the data. You can tell them all of the information, the studies, and even you can even visually represent this. But until it's in a palatable way that is meaningful for people, I'm not sure if we're really making a big dent in what we're trying to, uh, what we're trying to accomplish. I look at my own family in that (laughs) way. I love my mother dearly. She's my best friend. She thinks that eating vegetables from a can is healthy. She's like, I'm eating healthy. Where does that Delta of knowledge, where's that knowledge gap exist? And I look at the fact that I have to explain to her mom, turn it, turn the can around and look at the sodium content. You already have hypertension. These are things that, is near and dear to my heart because there's a lot of folks out there that just don't get it. And we're not talking about just poorly educated folks. We're talking about this is ubiquitous sort of thing across the United States of America. And what does that mean for the general population? I think it's really a challenge that we struggle with. 100% absolutely. And that's kind of part of my motivation for doing this particular show and bringing on people that just like you did kind of in plain English language, just as plain as can be. Where are you going to be? It's not just about lifespan, it's about health span. And I tell my patients all the time, and when they're already sick and they're 40 years old, I say, this is what you want to be like for the rest of your life, because they're only going to get worse, because all I have to do is ask them what their day is like, what their diet's like, if they're exercising, if they're doing all these things. 
I, I just asked them, I point blank, and they actually are pretty accepting of it. I was like, this is what you want to do. I was like, when you were 15 years old, did you envision yourself as a sick 40-year-old person and only getting sicker? And I think those kinds of simple terminologies mm -hmm. really resonate with people and have them start thinking. And I just tell them point blank, you're going to get sicker and sicker. And you know what? The drugs that we put you on to just kind of sustain you mm -hmm. may make you even sicker because mm -hmm. I challenge people to look at the side effects of every single medication that they mm -hmm. take. And those drugs themselves then cause other chronic illnesses. And it's a vicious, terrible cycle of being ill. And our population is getting sicker and sicker at a younger and younger age. And as a physician, mm -hmm. seeing this over my 18 year career, I always talk about it. It's absolutely heartbreaking. And I talk mm -hmm. about it ad nauseum. I'll talk about it to anybody I can find. I mean, I got scribes right. there and front desk people. And I'm just, I come out of <laughs> right. rooms and I'm like, how in the world that right. person become what they are right now? And you hit right. on another thing, completely clueless. No understanding right. in any way, shape or form. Yeah. It's like I'm telling them something for the first time. Like they've never heard this, but they have no idea what I'm saying. Right. Very interesting. I think there's been a lot of work to be able to figure out again, you're talking like a lot of public health sort of messaging and, right. and how do you get it to, how do you get it to stick? How do you make the take home point sticky? And it is very difficult. Again, I use my own mother and I love her to death, but her doctors are just not doing a good enough job. They're explaining risk to her every time she goes to her primary care. They're saying this is going to worsen your these chronic diseases, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't think that it's not for lack of trying. I think that the challenge is how do you distill this information to a point where it's actually providing true meaning? Are you okay with having an amputation? What would that do to your functionality in life? What if you didn't have your legs? How would you get up and down your stairs? What if you didn't make it to your grandbaby's birthday what happens to your wife if you pass away and she's a a stay-at-home mother i think these types of questions that we pose to our question to our patients have to be bigger than this is the data this is where you're trending here's the graph it looks abysmal but i think we really need to be able to as clinicians to figure out a way to be more relatable with our population and that's just in a one-on-one -on -one setting, how do we do that writ large? How do we craft our messaging so that we're doing that not just for our individual patients, but to populations of patients and legislators and folks who have influence on the things that we're trying to do? We could unpack this. I mean, literally, we could be here for another two hours talking <laughs> right. about it. And for those that know me, we definitely can go down that road. So sure. I think what I'd love to do now is really pick your brain on military and veterans health, because this is something that, that you, I mean, I've read some of your stuff. I mean, you are at the forefront of this and I can tell you it's so near and dear to my heart. I didn't serve my, I didn't serve myself. I have some family members that serve, but every single veteran that comes in or occasionally I'll see an active person if they're on leave or something like that. I thank them always for their service because Without people like yourself and without them, I mean, I could not have enjoyed the freedoms that I have and my children enjoy their freedoms and on. So uh, again, it's near and dear to my heart. But one of the things I have seen as a spine surgeon is I feel like there's definitely some holes in the care of veterans. At least my expertise is obviously in, in treating spinal conditions. And it's been really nice to see that Although there are really some excellent spine surgeons that, that work in the VA, because those systems sometimes are somewhat overwhelmed, it is nice that the Veterans Administration has been so good about allowing them to find care in the private practice world, and it's really mm -hmm. decompressed the system. So I take care of a lot of veterans, and it is it just I'm so privileged to be able to do that. So I'm going to start with a general question, and then we could go down into a little bit more detail. But what do you think has been the most improved thing, let's say, over the last decade, as far as care of military and veterans? 
And what do you th- where do you think that the holes are and things that you're committed to looking into and making better? Great question. Yeah. I think one of the biggest pieces, kind of going back to legislation, is the PACT Act that was uh, that was signed in 2022 that allows for us to be able to look at combat related exposures. And so for myself, in my campaigns that I've engaged in in Afghanistan, we largely were exposed to certain things like open burn pits and airborne hazards as we were fighting in the deserts and things like that. So particular matter 2.5 and particular matter 10 and all these other things that we were exposed to. We have legislation now that allows for us to allow for presumptive conditions for both evaluation, treatment, and compensation. And so I think that was one of the most significant things that that we've done. And it wasn't just for my generation of warfighter. It was also for Asian Orange and Vietnam and on. And so we're able to now look at what we know from the comparing our service members to the general population that there might be a higher incidence of head and neck cancer or fill in the blank with whatever condition it is. And so we've outlined that in legislation to say, if you were exposed to this, you know, the dose makes the poison. We don't know what that dose was. And so what we're going to do is for the benefit of the veteran, we're going to compensate you, evaluate you and treat you appropriately just by having that exposure. That's something that, that didn't exist from my father's generation. He, his generation was in that, in, in Vietnam and they were fighting for, I was exposed to this pesticide, herbicide, Asian orange, and things like that. It was interesting to see that these veterans that had these exposures couldn't explain why they had these these conditions at a higher incidence than the general population, but they couldn't get compensated. They couldn't get treatment for it. So I think that legislation was uh, critical. And I think that was a very, that was a leap forward for us to be able to do this work. And that's honestly, the work that I do now is being able to perform these registry exams to, uh, to aggregate that data, to inform the science as to what these exposures mean. And as we go forward in time, there's a propensity for more diagnoses to be included into those presumptive conditions so that a, we can study these conditions and the correlated exposures, but also to be able to provide that comprehensive care to our veterans that most need it. So I think that was dramatic in the last couple of years. Oh yeah. Thanks for that. The PACT Act is something that I did a little reading on. I think it's fantastic that those exposures are being looked at. One of the things I wasn't because it's just not something that's ever literally been mentioned in a clinic by a patient is these burn pits. And it's insane. I just started digging into some of the things that are thrown in there. I didn't realize that some of these burn pits are like 10 kilometers wide. I mean, you are inhaling massive amounts of who knows what. Feces, plastics, whatever it was. Benzene, all kinds. I mean, there's, there's, Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the tires are, it's insane. And it's interesting because I started going down, I love going down rabbit holes, by the way, which is why this wellness thing is just so amazing. But then you start correlating it with, I know that there is a list. I looked at kind of the list of like COPD and like lung things and then Mm -hmm, cancers, mm -hmm. cardiovascular disease are all associated Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to it. But on a more kind of generalized level, if you look at things that cause mitochondrial dysfunction, these small molecules, like for example, heavy metals will accumulate inside your mitochondria and right. some of these other things. It's just a pretty fascinating, and they cause those mitochondria to misfire, to malfunction because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. mitochondrial wall doesn't work properly. And right. so you get all of these kind of chronic mitochondrial diseases, not the genetic type of mitochondrial diseases, but just mitochondrial dysfunction. And so it's interesting to think about why so many vets or even active personnel, just they're not feeling well, because Mm -hmm. these things like burn pits and other exposures can really create significant damage to your mitochondrial health. And so Mm -hmm. it'll be really interesting in seeing how some of these like other measures, like I'm like really big into kind of like red light therapies and some of Mm -hmm. these other things. And it would be fascinating to look at veterans and start looking at some of these exposures and then putting people that are exposed 
in things that are known to enhance mitochondrial health. Not mm. just, I mean, there's mm -hmm. supplements mm -hmm. like NAD mm -hmm. and other things, mm -hmm. coenzyme Q10, things like mm -hmm. that. also exposing their mitochondria to light, which then absorbs in the mitochondrial wall and helps them to work better. So I started right. going down that rabbit hole and I've got about 10 studies I'd like to do on, uh, on this. So I just, I just want to start looking down, down that hole, but it's interesting because we talk about all these major things, but what about all of these vets that, that just don't feel well, right? Like their main right. thing is I'm tired. I don't feel well. Right. Looking at right. their dysfunction because of their exposure, like compensating them for just not feeling well is a blessing. Right. They've served our country. They deserve right. to be compensated for it because they're doing something to protect all of us. Right. And yet the rest of their lives might be impacted. So I think we there's so much that we don't know about treating mitochondrial dysfunction. And it's, it's just become such a passion of mine. And I hope that not only we can we help the general population, but we could also really help active military and veterans get through some of these things. I mean, all of these diseases, even cardiovascular, all these brain things, PTSD, for example, some of it right. has to do with mitochondrial dysfunction, concussion as well, which was going to be my next question to you. It's interesting that you talked about that. We have these multi-system sort of syndromic conditions. One of them is Gulf War illness. We just have not up to this point figured out what explains this constellation of symptoms. And so I think some of the work that you're doing may be instrumental in really understanding how these constellation of symptoms work. And a lot of it kind of falls in line with things that we have seen like, uh, oh, geez, fibromyalgia. Conditions like that, where we really don't, I mean, we sort of characterize it um, and we've labeled a diagnosis on top of that constellation of symptoms, but we don't truly understand it. And so I think that what you're working on may be instrumental in that. I appreciate that. And so one of the things that we're doing, for example, fibromyalgia is a great, great example. There are all these types of things that we see where I, as a physician, see it. It's not necessarily mm -hmm. my area of expertise. And I send them out to the experts. Mm -hmm. And But the problem is that so many people in the public and obviously in the military, they do not fall into that box. Like mm -hmm. they don't have rheumatoid arthritis. Mm -hmm. But you know what? They have joint swelling. They have rheumatoid-like symptoms or kind of autoimmune-like conditions that are not necessarily associated with some of the generic genetic disorders but it's in and of itself. So understanding some of this, I think that medicine in, in general, but just also these, some of these alternative therapies are going to come so far. But for example, like for patients that have fibromyalgia that have something called like post Lyme's disease, which is another good one. We don't know why after you recover from the actual acute illness, necessarily why people are still having these autoimmune responses. I mean, some of it is latent, mm -hmm. you know, latent uh, uh, bug in there, but other things we just don't understand. And it presents so differently mm -hmm. as I'm sure Gulf War illness does. And there, mm -hmm. there's not these boxes. So is treating them with oxygen therapy and light therapy and all these other things that we do know that improve mitochondrial function, is that mm -hmm. the way to go? Including fixing other insults, like getting them completely gluten-free, getting them their sugar intake down to just a tiny amount. Mm -hmm. How do we put all of these things together and make these people healthier because a lot of them have seen so, and you know this, how some of them have seen 10, 15 people from, that no one can give them an answer. Right. So going to these just general, like kind of things that we can do for them to improve their mitochondrial health has really become a passion of mine. And again, I don't have the answers, but mm -hmm. I'm going to talk to anybody that might have the answers and together, maybe we can figure out a way to, to get people's lives better. It's such a tough thing. And I mean, we could just rack our brains for hours and hours on this one subject. Right. Another thing that is obviously very common, and you see this, and it might not be something where you specifically have spent a lot of, of time in that area of medicine, but obviously I know you're exposed to these things, is mm -hmm. concussion and then the related post-traumatic stress disorder that comes with not just concussion, but obviously military post-concussion, I mean, post traumatic stress disorder is well, well studied in, in, in military mm -hmm. settings. What are your kind of thoughts on kind of the advances in concussion treatment in military settings? Any thoughts you might have on that in PTSD? 
and I'll share a couple of the the kind of the thoughts that I have mm-hmm. in some things that I believe personally, again, it's my own opinion, but I believe personally should be available to, to the military community. Yeah, I'm curious to know what those are. I can tell you that, P- as you may well know, PTSD, is, there's a significant disease burden for the military for a lot of different reasons. Right. Many people may think of combat, but there's PTSD that are, that arises out of training activities, combatives, which was which is basically hand hand combat that we do for battlefield readiness, parachuting. I'm a parachutist, and so there were a lot of times that you don't glide down to the ground nice and smooth the way you might think. You fall down like a sack of potatoes, and so sometimes you ring your bell in that regard. But, you know, a lot of the advances, even in our military equipment, we started to heart, hearten up our vehicles in Afghanistan and Iraq during my time in combat in, in such a way that we increased the survivability of things like improvised explosive devices. And so we had these MRAPs, which is large vehicles that are able to absorb a lot of blast and prevent penetrating trauma. We had up armored vehicles, which if you can imagine like a Humvee, but it has much more armor. So again, you don't have a lot of penetrating trauma, but when these vehicles would hit improvised explosive devices, people are bounced all around in a very traumatic way. And so we started seeing increased survivability on the battlefield from a trauma perspective, but higher rates of, of MTBI. And so to your point, a lot of times that TBI is connected to just the exposure of combat itself. And there's a a correlation with PTSD as well. I think the military has done a very good job with what we consider the defense intrepid network for TBI and brain health. And I think that's been very instrumental in both understanding the clinical care that's required to be able to treat these patients, the education for these patients, and also informing the research. I've had some very good friends of mine that have been exposed to IEDs in Afghanistan and Iraq that have gone through some of these integrated health care settings that address brain health and TBI. Mm -hmm. And it's the whole range of integrated care from psychologists to be able to address some of the psychological components. A lot of what you're talking about, the alternative therapies, yoga, meditation, again, looking at neurologists and more of the direct clinical folks that are doing a lot of that work. And I think one of the things that that the military has an advantage of is that it's an integrated healthcare system. So you're not going to different places for this type of care. It's all informed in an integrated fashion in one electronic health record that's oftentimes done in one center. And so the military, I think, has done a very good job of being able to recognize the burden of disease as it relates to TBI and PTSD. Um, and being able to concentrate that care, A, in a lot of these centers, but B, giving out clinical practice guidelines for the primary care providers to be able to quickly screen and say, I think that this warrants a further evaluation and being able to refer that patient out to one of these comprehensive centers. I've not experienced the TBI, but I have quite a few friends that I have, and, and reportedly they've had some very good care as it relates to to being able to comprehensively address many of these issues. One of my good friends is stationed overseas right now in Italy, and he went to Germany for one of these comprehensive evaluations. He had intensive outpatient behavioral health and all these other things that are associated with trying to understand how to appropriately diagnose, treat, and move on to a road of rehabilitation, whether that's a return to duty or to the civilian sector. I think that the military has made great strides and being able to address that. I mean, I think that's great. And it's interesting because a lot of, there's a lot of good literature that comes out specifically out of the military on, on concussion, especially looking at kind of what the, how the concussion evolves and Mm -hmm. what people are going to be able to return to. It's interesting. There's a really good textbook that I'm working through on concussion it's it, for lack of better term in lay in in lay terms, it's a heavy book. Even for myself as a as a physician, it's really in depth, mm-hmm. hardcore science down to really to, to the mitochondrial level. And it's fascinating to see how much we've learned, but it's also fascinating to see how little we still know. 
in my in my last podcast, which is actually coming out very shortly after this is being recorded with Dr. Eric Nussbaum, world-renowned neurosurgeon, he's also frustrated at sort of some of the lack of progress that has been made in 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 healing the brain. And a lot of that is because mm-hmm. we don't understand mm-hmm. what happens. There's all these different theories, but if you look at more kind of the micro level and how the mitochondria get injured, how the neurons and the axons get impacted, it's very interesting to see some of the different things and kind of trying to reroute the pathways through kind of neurocognitive approaches. Some of the things you talked about that are mm-hmm. obviously being done in the military, neuropsychiatric approaches, some pharmacology, some mm-hmm. other things. But one of the things that Dr. Nussbaum has been working on is something called the NeuroGlove, which basically focuses on creating these tactile impulses to the hand, which has mm-hmm. a large representation in the homunculus, which is basically the representation mm-hmm. of your hand and your brain. And so if you do that with a constant randomized pattern, they've shown in clinical studies that patients improve from, mm. from TBI because you're helping to kind of rewire the brain, so to speak, in a different way than perhaps, for example, some of these other intensive therapies are doing, like intensive cognitive therapy and some mm-hmm. of these other things that have been around for a long time. So I think that's going to be one of the approaches that is going to be fascinating to see how it works. One of the things I've personally become really interested in, and very few people know about this, is this transcranial light therapy, mm-hmm. which is basically red light and near-infrared light that penetrate can penetrate the skull. Not a lot mm-hmm. of it will penetrate the skull. Mm-hmm. The little bit that does penetrate the skull was actually shown in a study at a Harvard in 21 to actually heal the brain tracks. And Mm. so we knew that it was already helping people to recover faster. And there are docs in the NFL that are using it. I'm sure it's been used somewhat in the military, but it's certainly that study. The beauty is that actually they tied the recovery of the patients, which was dramatically different at six months and using that with what their MRIs look like. It was the first study to ever do that. It was randomized controlled study. So it'll be interesting if things like transcranial red light therapy or something that becomes mainstay in the in the military and used across the VA. And this is certainly something that we're going to be approaching mm-hmm. different hospital systems here in the Twin Cities to look at doing studies, both with that and then Dr. Nussbaum's invention, the NeuroGlove and some other some other thoughts that we have. So mm-hmm. it's just such a fascinating thing. But obviously in the military, huge problem. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think one of the confounding variables in all of this is the fact that underreporting or lack of reporting continues to be an issue. I, as we learn more about MTBI and things like that in the military, it, I can talk to any number of soldiers and say, listen, how many airborne jumps have you had where where you had a dizzy spell, if you for, you know, using layman terms? How many times have you hit an IED? How many times have you been in combatives? How many on and on throughout an entire career for a lot of these people? And then the follow-up to that question is how many times were you actually evaluated? And we know that repeated traumas worsen the severity of TBI. But I think in the military, unfortunately, there's a notion of just driving on. You'll be okay. And I think that the lack of reporting in many of these instances is probably higher than we even really understand or know just because it is very difficult to continue with combat operations because you've experienced that MTBI. Many of these people, they will present once they've developed more advanced symptoms or once they've been asked the questions, let's say for a disability examination or something like that. And how many times have you hit an, had an explosion or had been had a concussion blast or something like that? At that point, we're getting very dated information that's oftentimes confounded by the fact that you're relying on the patient's memory. It was in a distant past. There were a lot of other things that that contribute that maybe the NFL football player who has a witness concussion and is brought off the field. I think many of our service members just don't have that luxury. But again, I think we need to be more diligent on being able to recognize what that looks like. And again, I think this is, again, there's medical folks, but drilling all the way down to the combat operators who are supervising a lot of this stuff, being able to 
give them the understanding of when to raise the red flag to say that this person needs an evaluation, much like it is in the NFL these days where everything's on camera. I mean, we can identify when someone needs to be carted off the field and further evaluated. Yeah, I think, I mean, again, an, another great answer, and we could unpack that for the next hour. But what one of the similarities and something I've talked about before is it's a very similar to high school and college sports mm-hmm. where th- there's a couple things. One, there's stigma. Mm-hmm. So people Absolutely. don't want to say anything because once you say, you know what, I'm having, I'm irritable. I'm not myself. I have a headache, right? That means not playing in the military. It means not your being liability. able to perform your liability. They, you might not be wanted there. Or that's the perception. What's also interesting in, in what you said about the way we're kind of getting to it because I firmly believe that early treatment is absolutely the best way to go. Brain rest and these mm-hmm. other things we talked about are absolutely vital because as that second impact is such a magnifying problem. Mm-hmm. And obviously mm-hmm. in the military, it's like the risk of second impact is off the charts, just with mm-hmm. training, just with training. Mm-hmm. But interestingly, if you when you ask athletes of, oh, have you had a concussion? A lot of them will say, oh, no, 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 I never had a concussion. You say the word. Right. However, if you ask them specific symptoms, known symptoms of concussion, all of the sudden, the numbers of people that have you realize in retrospect that have had concussion is much, much higher than what we're knowing. One of the questions right. I've asked many experts is, do we really know how many concussions are really out there? The answer is we have no clue. There is way more concussion that we're talking about. And these can have serious long-term effects, including these repeated impacts, potentially leading to some like early neurodegenerative conditions. Mm-hmm. And, and then so if you start adding concussion with metabolic dysfunction, you put them together, now you have like really early onset dementias and things like that. I mean, there, there, mm-hmm. there's just mm-hmm. so many things that we're trying to put together. And that's mm-hmm. why like, I just love talking. We, I could talk about this stuff all day, every day, right. because- we just don't know. And it's actually kind of fun not knowing things and, right. and just being those people that say, well, you know what? We're going to ask 50,000 questions until I figure out something. We right. got to find something. We have to do it better. So thanks for that great answer on concussion. And I hope that things keep getting better because obviously we want to take care of active military and our vets. And so Absolutely. I want to get into sort of the, the, the last part on tie it all all together more about kind of prevention and your own personal advice and, and kind of the way you think about things and what the advice like what like how do you talk to your colleagues or to vets and things like that so my first question would be what would be your advice in maintaining mental health fitness in the military because the stresses and the rigors of our I don't know what it's like I know what the rigors are of doing a training program and in, in orthopedics surgery and then in spine surgery, mm-hmm. at times it's very difficult. So mm-hmm. I have my own things that I tell people that are going through training mm-hmm. now, but in the military, there's just all these other confounding variables. And at times right. I'm sure that, I mean, the anxiety, the depression, I mean, there have to be times where people are at absolute lows. What's your advice in them being able to maintain mental fitness? As I've sort of explained in different points of this conversation is that a lot of times the health related solutions are not the answer. A lot of times is leadership or policy or culture. And so one of the things that I will point to that we still struggle with in the military is not the paucity of care that's available. It's available. It's available to every single service member that raises their hand and says they'll support and defend the constitution Mm. of the United States. The challenge is is the stigma. Think about some of the positions that I've had. You would never want to say, yes, I have depression or anxiety if you're going to go work at the White House medical unit to be within arm's length of the president. You would not want to say that same thing if you're wanting to go to BUDS and to be a Navy SEAL or to go into U.S. Army Special Forces training or whatever it is, fill in the blank. There's all sorts of special pilots are notorious for saying, nope, no to everything. You, but you're bleeding out of your ears. Nope, I'm fine. And so I think 
that we have to address the element of stigma from a leadership perspective and make it okay to not be okay. Make it so that just as you would go to your doctor, PA, whatever it is for knee pain, this is the same way that we approach it. And it's not from the medical folks that it really matters because we get it. We've been trained in the medical model. We understand what's at risk. We understand what we can do, what's in our armamentarium to be able to treat it. It's really from the leadership. When I'm speaking to the, the United States military at large, we have to be okay with not being okay. We need generals and flag officers and admirals to say, there was a point in time when I was not okay and I got treatment. We need other senior enlisted personnel and warrant officers to say, I'm setting the conditions because I want you to be combat ready, combat effective. And when it's time, and I'm going to say this, but when it's time to put warheads on foreheads and support and defend in our constitution, I need you to be ready. And if that means you need to go and get care, then I'm going to set the conditions for you to be able to do so. Because it's not an access to care issue. It's not a cost issue. It's not a social determinants of health issue. It's not an underinsured or not insured issue. It's largely... In my assessment, culturally, it's just frowned upon because of the potential sequelae associated with that. What does this mean to my career if I raise the red flag and say I have some anxiety or I have some depression or I'm having nightmares? And until we can get to the point where we can say that ubiquitously across the entire formation of the United States military, that everyone understands that it's okay to not be okay at this moment. We're going to continue to have these issues. I think this is a leadership issue, not a patient care issue. I mean, I, I think that's a great answer. And interestingly, in, our, in, in my profession as a physician, but especially, mm -hmm. especially in, the, in, in some of the more, let's just say, the kind of the difficult surgery specialties as far as training and your kind of upbringing, but definitely the culture, mm -hmm. the way we go through these tremendous, rigorous training programs. Mm -hmm. working a hundred hours mm -hmm. a week, it's a little bit better, but I can tell you when I was doing my training, it was very frowned upon to talk about you're at a low, that you're having difficulty tolerating this. Th those people were just not wanted, right? You, mm -hmm. they want superheroes. They want people that, that can tolerate it. We're not built to be able to tolerate some of these things. And there has been and you know this because you walk on both, both but as a medical provider and in the military, you mm -hmm. see what's going on kind of in the medical. There is so much out there now telling people not to be afraid and not to be afraid to come out because as suicide rates amongst uh, physicians become a really significant problem and depression rates yes. and things like that. And so we have to get over that stigma. And so I really appreciate your perspective on not being stigmatized. Not, But that also goes to the other thing you just said about leadership. Because mm -hmm. when you start talking about the leadership part of it, it also is very important for those that ultimately are in charge. Because it's fine, for example, let's say as a training physician or a as a practicing physician, I raise my hand and say, you know what, I'm really not feeling well. If I am under the kind of general supervision of a leader that is not accepting of that, and then they're going to stigmatize me mm -hmm. and say, I'm weak because I'm saying that I have some something going on right. or I don't feel well or something like that, that environment, that has to go. And I think there has been a lot of significant changes. And I think there has been a cultural shift for sure. Just as we've shifted our culture, inclusivity and other things, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. we are definitely shifting our culture on mental health and definitely making sure that we protect people. And I could tell you, like as running our organization, our spine and neurosurgery clinic, I am always in tune in and watching for signs that people are stressed within mm -hmm. the organization mm -hmm. and making sure that as a leader, I'm keenly aware of that and, mm -hmm. and not letting people suffer in a situation where they really legitimately need help. And that goes from doctors all the way down to our employees that maybe just answer phone calls and things like that, because everybody's stressed and we don't want anybody in our culture to feel that there's anything wrong with going through a, 
very challenging time because just as things go badly on the military, do- doctor of providers, I'm sure you've been there. We see bad things happen to patients. It's devastating sometimes. Yep. I'm not afraid to talk about it. I tell families when I see things or somebody is not doing well, I'm personally affected by that. I'm devastated by it personally. There's no question. Mm-hmm. I, I, I wear that on my sleeve. It affects mm-hmm. me. I'm not like, mm-hmm. well, I'm the doctor and we're going to look at this as a scientific. These are people. We experience the same emotions as, mm-hmm. as everybody else. So same thing in the military. I thought that was a, just a brilliant answer that, that you gave on that. I think that was just spot on, as spot on as you could get. <laughs> Well, I mean, to, to your point, the, any high performing field, th- it is often something that that we try to minimize our, our symptoms and we try we try our best to just elbow through things. But I have a lot of physician counterparts, other health allied health professionals that have told me on private conversations, I'm struggling, but I would never. I would never highlight this because what does that mean to my license? What does that mean when I have to answer those questions as I'm going through my credentialing process or whatever it is? I just think that is one of those things that we have to follow society. The military is less than 1%. It's a microcosm of society. Writ large, we have to address this mental health crisis. Full court press. I mean, there's a lot of issues that go into this, but I think one of them is to ensure that from a leadership perspective, that we're creating the conditions for people to not be penalized for taking care of themselves. I think if people, you know, heed your advice and think about just continuing to improve the culture, military, in the you know, medical world, in the in in the larger community out there, I think if we start looking at the culture and how we see mental health, but also then bringing in how does nutrition affect mental health? Mm-hmm. How does sleep pattern affect mental mm-hmm. health? How do some of these alternative things, Absolutely. how can those turn around mental health? We start putting together these extremely complex puzzles. We could make such amazing differences, but I think we just have so much to learn together. And it, conversations like these are just like incredible. And they need to be happening in the thousands and tens of thousands. Right. And we are going to get somewhere but again, it can't just be so disconnected where somebody's working in a lab and coming up with some discovery, but they're disconnected from the from the policy right. and the culture because right. that's our problem. We're not talking to each other. We're siloed. That nexus. Yeah, that we're nexus that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're siloed. We're like, I do this and this is how we fix everything. And you do that. And, and we're right. just so fragmented. I think we need to look at the totality of what's mm. going on just as people providers, whatever, and right. really look at the whole, like a whole body approach. And that's something that right. I, honestly, I was lacking and I'm going to try to make up for it. And in, in the rest of my career, what I was lacking and being so focused on, on just like spine health and let's fix that scoliosis. Mm-hmm. Let's fix that thing. Now it's just like, let's fix you. That is a paradigm shift. It really is. No, I feel, I mean, I feel, <laughs> I don't want to, so, but it's like a born again thing for me, right? Which is why last night I was at a as I was at a function, and I know my wife is she's sitting next to me and she's like, "Here we go," because <laughs> there was a couple people in healthcare that were around the table and they asked a couple questions and I j- and I couldn't help it and and we just mm. went into this huge discussion mm-hmm. about everything that we need to do to try to fix the problem of like chronic disease, whether it be physical and or mental. And it was, it turned out to be an amazing, engaging discussion. And at the end of the day, my wife didn't give me too much of a hard time because we, she's, she didn't want me to really push in that direction, but it went there and everybody was into it. And and I kept asking, you want to talk about other stuff? And they're like, no, this is amazing. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. I tend to do that. So I really appreciate this conversation. This has been, I mean, like literally a, a tour de force. And I hope that people have the patience to really listen to this this whole thing from your story to our discussion about general health topics to military topics to to mental right. health and i just want to end with sort of one final question and then i'm just going to ask you to tell everyone how they can find you and all, all that good stuff 
I know that you are really passionate about just general global health. Is there something mm -hmm. you want to tell our audience about what you're really passionate about in global health and some of the initiatives you're really going to be working on over, let's say, the next five, 10 years, or what you really are is deep down a passion for you in, in, in helping the global health community? It's a complicated question that deserves a complicated answer, but I'll just say it depends. The global pandemic allowed us to see that a disease across the entire world can impact us here in the United States. Even if we've had that now in our distant memory, and it's not something that's top of mind, and now it's, uh, I don't know, border issues or the economy or what have you, it's to realize that we're all interconnected. And the better that we all do, the better collectively that we do, every, all tides, the tide rises all boats. In the global health space, it's realizing that infectious disease that's not stamped out in other parts of the world will find its way to the United States as we have all these other changes that continue to propagate the spread of infectious disease. It's also to say that even if you don't care about what's happening in Sub-Saharan Africa, the cost of healthcare in the United States, as we pool just health in our health insurance, the way it works is we pool all of this together and it's based on risk. And so if the population is sicker, writ large, then it costs us individually more to be able to cover ourselves and take care of ourselves. So it's in everyone's interest, ironically, to be interested in everyone else. It's in everyone's interest to, to do everything they can to make sure that other people are healthy. If you live on one side of Washington, D.C., and you say, I don't live across the Anacostia River. Well, guess what? Your emergency department is full and your wait times are higher because they don't have a good emergency department or they have more issues that are bringing them to the emergency department or they don't have access to care. And that's the reason why they're treating the ED as their primary care provider. It is in everyone's interest to be concerned about everyone else. And to me, that just means love thy neighbor from a biblical standpoint. I think that whether it's domestically or internationally, that needs to be our focus writ large. And it doesn't matter if your bottom line is GDP, healthier populations create more wealth. We should all just be interested in one another. So that's really the work that I do. I work in different capacities. I advise other countries. I've advised recently the country of Ecuador, how to build sustainability and prepare for things like El Nino. I've worked with other nonprofit organizations around the world. I have this endeavor that I'm probably going to embark upon, which I've shared with you personally, but is not right for uh, for prime time. But but I'm always looking at ways to create solutions that are not going to be tailored to just one segment of society, but that is going to have a broad reaching approach to be able to impact society at large. And I think in the healthcare space, we're just one slice of that pie. We have to figure out, to your point, a way to walk, work cross-sectorally, to understand that the science can't be disconnected from the policy and the policy can't be disconnected from the implementation. And the more that we have people who are willing to work with one another, I think that all of these complex problems, whether it's TBI or infectious disease or chronic disease, I think we'll find solutions that are comprehensive, sustainable, and capacity building for the people who most need it. That is a wonderful way to end this. Love thy neighbor. We if Absolutely. if, if uh, we just have to think about each other. A anyway, I mean, I, I think if we live our lives like that, understanding that we we're not in this alone, and that we really should be caring for one another, I think it's just a happier and healthier place, and, and things will fall in line if, if if we do that for sure. So what I want to do is I. I want to end it by just letting the, uh, you know, the watchers or listeners know that they should absolutely be following you on LinkedIn. Your LinkedIn page is incredible. I've been following you for quite a while now. That's how we Thank connected. You. And some of the stories you share on there and your passion for just some of these things we talked about just shines through. And that definitely attracted me to wanting to have you come on and share your amazing story and, and the things that are doing. How else can people find you if they just want to connect with you or just learn more about your life story, things of that nature? Yeah, no, I, I think 
for that opportunity. When I went into the White House and some of the other positions, I had a very narrow social media footprint. It still remains very narrow. So LinkedIn is the only social media platform that I have. But if someone wants to reach out to me directly on LinkedIn, it's an open is open, is not closed to anyone. If there's a more direct engagement that you want to have, we can always exchange emails, phone numbers, and things like that. Always looking for opportunities to to work with others, as long as it's to our mutual benefit to uplift society writ large. And I look for more opportunities to be able to make an impact. So happy to connect with anyone that you recommend or who wants to connect with me. That's wonderful. And I certainly know that I will be connecting with you a lot because I, I think that we can definitely have some stimulating conversations and, and do some things together. Because obviously our worlds overlap more than even I thought before we had this, uh, this, uh, this two hour conversation here, which has been right. really incredible. And so again, I thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for your service. Thanks for like incredible answers. I think people are really going to enjoy this and find a tremendous, a treasure trove of, of information on this. And I think you're, a, a lot of people are going to take you up on your offer of, of reaching out. So be really careful for what you, uh, what you ask for and, and, and be prepared to be answering, uh, uh, <laughs> giving out a lot of your emails and phone numbers to people. So anyway, I would love to have you back in the future. And on that note, we'll end it there. And I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me.